Hey everyone, this is Steve Weintraub with Collider, and I am here at the Collider Sundance Studio, sponsored by Saratoga Spring Water. I want to give them a huge shout out because it costs a lot of money to be here uh, with Anton Corbin. Did I say that right? Pretty good, Anton Corbin. Right. I apologize because I asked you off camera how to pronounce it. I'm an a hole. Um, I love your work, and I uh, uh, I'm so happy that you're here in the studio for your documentary. Um, so I have a million questions for you, but I first want to say congrats for being part of Sundance this year. Cheers. I'm very happy to be here. So your resume is fantastic. You've directed feature films. You've done a doc. You've directed tons of music videos. Um, if someone has actually never seen anything that you've done before, what is the first thing you'd like them watching and why? Oh, um, well, obviously, I'm also a photographer yes. for uh, 50 years now. Um, so that is that. Also, but, you've done album covers. Like this, uh, yeah. I was more aiming at like things that they could watch. Okay, well, music video-wise, uh, there's um, uh, probably about 100 videos that I did. A lot of Depeche Mode. Uh, Nirvana is quite popular in America. I think uh, Hardship Box. Um, it's one of my favorites. Uh, Coldplay, Kill The Killers. You know, that's, that's, that's stuff. Um, and then uh, movies. I guess it starts with the first one, which is Control. This is a film about the singer of a band called Joy Division, who I knew. So it, it was the only only way I dared to make a movie is because I, I knew a lot about it. Yeah, I love Control. Um, and I, I that, that movie is fantastic. I, by the way, this is going to be most of the interview, me saying it's fantastic. Okay. I apologize. No, no, don't. Uh, but I am curious, with your feature films, including the documentary, um, how... Which one changed the most in the editing room in ways that you did not expect? Um, yeah, good question. I guess a documentary because um, you, you're not in charge the whole time. You, you know, I, I'm in charge of the stuff I shoot, but we had to use so much archival footage, which has to be found and put in there. And um, the editor, Andrew Hulme, is fantastic. He was also the editor for Control and for The American. Um, so, um, you know, I knew we were going to get a good movie out of it. So for, um, for, I haven't mentioned the title because I'm rude, but squaring the circle, the story, and you pronounce it hypnosis, hypnosis. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm curious for, listen, for most people watching this right now, they will not have seen the movie yet. So how or, have you or know what hypnosis is exactly? So how can you, how have you been saying to friends and family, what the documentary is about? Well, usually I keep it broader and say it's about album sleeve designers from the 70s, which is when album sleeve came, you know, became a force. And in the 80s, of course, we got CDs, so the album sleeve sort of deteriorated and the art with it. But um, it's, it's focused really on two guys. They formed a company called Hypnosis, and they were at school with Pink Floyd. And so they started with Pink Floyd, the first album, and they did all the albums for Pink Floyd. Uh, so most people know one or two of these albums, at least. Yeah, they, well, they're responsible for some of the most iconic images in rock history, and especially anything that people have seen in the 70s. I mean, they, they most likely did it. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> for me, I always like the, the more straightforward um, photography. Uh, so at the Heart Mother from Pink Floyd, or the Peter Gabriel sleeves, you know, the more, pink, the more straightforward photography in a way. But they were very clever. Uh, before uh, we had um, all the... Uh, um, uh, intricate things we can do now on uh, on the computer. They did it with uh, with a knife and glue and, and pieces of paper. They made really Im incredible collages and, and made the impossible possible. So I have to ask you, what was it that said, oh my God, I, I want to make this, I want to tell this story? Well, to be honest, I was asked to do it by Poe, who's the surviving member of Hypnosis. And uh, Poe is, uh, as you see in the film, a very good salesman. Um, <laughs> so he, he sold the concept to me. I came to Amsterdam where I live and um, I said I'll do it because obviously, you know, I only photograph because I love music so much. It was the only reason for me to pick up a camera was because I wanted to be closer to the music. And, um, you know, I said very simple beginnings as a fan, shooting people on stage and all that. But I became a portrait photographer in the end. But after wanting to publish in magazines, the next, the next and the highest level that I could think of at the time was doing record sleeves. So I looked at record sleeves from, from whatever, when I, I, I late, 60, late 60s onwards. And that was exactly when hypnosis started. Well, one of the things about the documentary is you have a Poe who's able to talk, but there, there's not a lot of footage from back then 
in their office working. Um, so what was it like for you when you decided, okay, I'm going to do this, but there's really limited assets to pull from in the seventies or maybe, you know what I mean? No, absolutely. And I had no idea what I said yes to in a way, you know, I jumped into it. And, um, uh, as you can see in the film, you know, the, the, the stuff at Poe is all my stuff. Uh, and the interviews with the Pink Floyd guys with Peter Gabriel, all, all that stuff came from me and Paul McCartney. But uh, all the other stuff we were, you know, searching and searching to find stuff that looked original. And of course, Storm had passed away, so we had to look at stuff that other TV stations made and all that stuff and, and put it together and do, do him justice as well. Sure. The thing that I found was um, for people that know Pink Floyd, they know that there's two members that are not exactly... Uh, best friends anymore, but you managed to get both of them in the movie. Um, so talk a little bit about getting them. And was there any sort of, like, was it difficult? And were they cool with both of them being in the film? How, how'd that go? Yeah, I mean, you know, Pink Floyd, I guess everybody knows they have four managers these days. It's for every member as a manager. So there's a bit of negotiating uh, going on. But I guess the love for uh, hypnosis overrode all that. And they wanted to be part of this. I mean, they were not at the same time in the studio, but they were all said yes to it in the end. I mean, it, it took sometimes a while, but <laughs> all done. Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, I believe it's probably, is it, it's probably Roger that's most like Storm in terms of, you know, very similar personalities. Yeah, and I think they were very close friends. And uh, But they had a bad falling out and then speak to each other for years. But before Storm died, they made up again, fortunately. And I think Roger always had a love for Storm anyway. Uh, it's just, I think, two headstrong characters. You know? So for people that don't realize, obviously you meant you touched on there was no computers back then when they were making their album covers. But the documentary uh, talks about like one time where they went up on a mountain taking, taking a helicopter with a statue to get the shot. You can't, um, these days, no one would ever do this. you know. But can you sort of talk about some of the crazy things that they did to get the shot to make the perfect album cover? Um, well, the, one of the craziest things is also in the film is uh, a sleeve for 10cc, where they uh, ha sold the idea of uh, having a, a sheep on a couch um, in in a beautiful ocean, uh, and um, they, so they went all the way to Hawaii, not realizing there's uh, no sheep in Hawaii, and there was not uh, there were no couches either for uh, um, uh, the psychoanalysis or whatever so they had a couch made and they had one sheep they found one sheep at the university <laughs> and they managed to give it a lot of volume and and shot it and then they used it this small on an album sleeve um so the, it's this crazy stuff of course but the one you mentioned is with paul mccartney and wings with a statue on the on the mountain top uh, with a helicopter um and then when they came back people said oh that was great but you could have done it in a studio with a bunch of salt <laughs> And that's true, but it's not not so much fun, of course. Sure, and it's it, the amount of money they spent to get the shot and to make an album cover. It's but also the adventure. You know, I, 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 one of the reasons I'm still a photographer is that I like the adventure, so I don't plan so many things. It's it's finding things on the way. So talk a little bit about. Uh, I would imagine with the doc, there must have been a longer cut. Did you ever have a version that was like three hours or much longer? There was a version that was a bit longer, but um, I think. We, from the outset, were quite conscious of it has to be watchable for people who don't know much about it. You can't just throw a three-hour documentary in their face. Sure. What, what was the, if you don't mind, um, what was the last thing that you cut out before picture locking? Was there like one story or one thing? Um, I think it was a conscious decision at least to keep the after hypnosis, the, the, the Greenback films, that, that part of it with the videos to... to uh, only actually sort of mention, not really showing the footage. Part of it because I didn't like it. You know, I didn't like what they were making. Um, it felt 70s to me, and, and that was in the 80s. Um, and I wanted to concentrate on the album sleeves. Sure. Is there, I mean, listen, they've made so many iconic images. Obviously, Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd is m possibly the most famous. As, as a, someone who makes album covers yourself and does so much photography, is there a what's one or two or three of the album covers that you think are just so iconic you know like favorite of, of their work yeah yeah well uh, for me atom heart mother just uh, putting a cow on an album sleeve i think that's an incredible statement Sp given you know it was uh, 1970 or whatever it was uh, very early on 
um, it's very radical. And, um, I, and that was Pink Floyd for people that sorry, don't realize. Pink Floyd, yeah. Because it doesn't say on the album sleeve either what it is. Um, I really love Peter Gabriel's first album sleeve in the car. Oh, yeah, that's a great cover. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, difficult deciding what I like best after that. But um, I guess I let Zeppelin album sleeve, um, House of the Holy. Is that the one with the baby? Like the, 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 the kids? The kids, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. there's also a great story about that. Um, yeah. But I, I have also an interview with Peter Seville in the film, which, who's a modern, more modern designer who worked at Joy Division and uh, established the whole factory records uh, aesthetic. Because I know he doesn't like hypnosis so much. I, I wanted to um, have that voice in there too. And one of my favorite album sleeves there is the uh, Joy Division, uh, Unknown Pleasures, which is not so dissimilar to Dark Side of the Moon, so we're comparing them as well. Sure, I'm glad you actually put that in the film to show that it wasn't just them, you know. Um, uh, so I am curious though, when you are making a film like this, did you have a date where you said to yourself, I need to be done by? Is there, like, what is it like as a director making a doc in terms of, you know, the, the you know, because you could spend years or you could also be like, I'm doing this over six months. Yeah, well, I mean, that would have been very optimistic for me to say that because we had this pandemic stuff happening and most of the people we film are towards 80 so they're all a little uh, scary <laughs> scared i should say of people coming to their home or themselves leaving the home but so it took a while you know we, we needed a longer time frame there um but it it, it it worked and it probably um was better for it i think to get to have more time I don't actually know the release plan. Is it for sale at Sundance? Does it have a distributor? Uh, distributor in America is uh, Utopia, and it's being released, I believe, first week of June or something. Oh, so, so uh, for theatrical. Sure. So for people that don't uh, won't be at Sundance, you will be able to see the film in June. Yeah, in, in theaters, which is uh, fantastic, because the music is, of course, great too. I, all, that's the other thing I was going to ask you about is that you got to put in a lot of music yeah. and I know music is expensive to put in a movie. So how the, did you have um, uh, uh, some blackmail or did people just say they, they want their music to be part of this? I, you know, I came on my bicycle here. So it's, it's, you know, we paid for it. <laughs> now, I think a lot of people wanted their music in it. So I'm sure that I was not part of the deal making. I'm sure we, we had favorable deals. I was going to say, I mean, if you're getting uh, all the, you know, Pink Floyd in it and uh, Led Zeppelin and these uh, artists, I would imagine they want their music to be with their images. Yeah, I, I would imagine that too. Yeah. Um, so I have, as a, as a uh, I'm curious, what are you, as, a, as another feature film in your horizon, yes. what are you actually working on now? Um I'm working on a film that we shoot, I think, in uh, October, November this year, in mostly in Europe. Can you give me any more, or are you, is it close to the vest? Um, well, it's a story about Patricia Highsmith, who was the, the writer of The Talented Mr. Ripley and A Stranger on a Train for Hitchcock and stuff like that. So is it a bio film, or? Uh, it's fictional, but yeah, there's... there's, there's Biographical elements in there for sure. Got it. Uh, I like. I'm going to keep on digging. Is it have a title? Yes. You're not going to share. Yes, I can share it. Got it. Uh, <laughs> it's called Switzerland. It's called Switzerland. Yeah. Is it? Uh, do you have a? Um, if you don't mind me asking, who is uh, paying for it? Does it have a distributor? Like, is it? No. Yeah, we're selling it. Um, uh, we're putting a package together. And that's oh, I like this. Um, well, first of all, I really hope this comes together, which I'm confident it will. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, what if actually you uh, you obviously have very good taste. What is the last movie or TV show that you've really loved that you want to recommend to people? Oh, uh, I don't think I've seen anything that people are not aware about. You know, the the Benches of Inniskillen is is great. That's the last film I saw that I really loved. I think. Um, yeah, what did I see on the plane yesterday? Uh, some documentary um, uh, about uh, anyway, some documentary. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very memorable documentary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Brian Wilson. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, touching. I mean, it, aesthetically, it's not that, that great, but it's touching to to see. Uh, and you mentioned at the beginning um, some of the music videos you've done. If someone has not seen any of the music videos, is there one you want them starting with or two? Uh, the new one of Depeche Mode that comes out in February. Oh, so you've already shot this? Yeah. Uh, which, for which song? Uh, it's called um, uh, Ghost Again. 
my last thing for you. Um, how much is it, because you, you've shot so many music videos, how much is it a collaboration with the band that you're working with and how much are they hiring you because they want you to bring what you do to the music? Well, mostly the, the latter, but um, my most well-known video was written by somebody else and that's Hard Shape Box and it's 90% written by Kurt Cobain. And then I've, I've changed some things, but he had very strong visual ideas. Yeah, if you don't mind a follow up, um, I obviously love his work. And um, uh, if, if anyone, if no one has seen Montage of Heck, uh, 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 Brett's film, it's fantastic. But what was it like actually work with working with him? And what do you think might surprise fans of Kurt to learn? Uh, well, I guess that he was one of the sweetest guys you could you could imagine. You know, I really like Kurt. And he asked me <coughs> for another video for, uh, for um, Penny Royalty, which is the next single. And I said, no, I, I can't do it, Kurt, because the video we just did is so good. It worked so well. I'm going to disappoint you with the next one, because I, I don't think we can go to that level. So he then said, well, if you don't do it, I will never make another video again. And he never did. So in, in hindsight, I should really have done that video. <laughs> um, for, I didn't know that story. And um, thank you for sharing. And uh, listen, I, for, for everyone at Sundance, uh, definitely definitely check out the doc. And for anyone who's not here, you'll be able to see it in June. I really want to give you a sincere thank you for coming in our studio. Oh, my pleasure. And a huge thank you to all of our sponsors. And um, thank you so much, really, sincerely. I appreciate it very much. You pay attention to the work. Thanks.